the future of retail Asia with June and Imran, powered by AI Amazing. Welcome back to the future of retail Asia, one of Feet Spot's top 50 best retail podcasts. How about that? My name is Imran. And I'm Jun. Joining us today is April Cole. Welcome to the show, April. Thank you, Jun. So April is the Managing Director of the Perfect Media Group. Welcome again. The cre- and uh, They are a creative digital advertising group that helps elevate brand awareness through out-of-home marketing and outdoor advertising. So April leads the company and has served many different clients across multiple industries all over Southeast Asia. This includes prime advertising locations such as shopping malls, retail districts. And I think today uh, we have the benefit of having here, here today uh, with a very interesting point of view into the whole retail industry. So welcome again. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, very interesting to hear from you that we want to start off like some of the question that uh, you have done with the shopping mall or around the shopping mall, right? I remember last year that I saw some of the digital billboard in uh, South Korea. They played mm. a 3D video, right? Yes. When someone stand in front of the billboard and then there's some video like will come out. Mm. So, so I'm just curious that do you have any experience like, or do you see anything in Southeast Asia or in Singapore? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's a very um, popular trend that's caught on. So even like beginning of this year, um, it was the charging year of the Ox, right? Mm. So the Malaysia Pavilion also did something similar where they had this this bull that was like crashing out of the iconic um, L-shaped screen, mm. right? So that was a very interesting execution. Even in Jakarta, there's also now a 3D screen, um, Thailand as well, and Vietnam. Uh, Singapore, I think maybe we're working on it or somebody is working on something equally creative, but that was just something that people like to talk about. And that's the trend right now in outdoor advertising. If you're going to spend money on like creating a beautiful billboard, you must well make something that people will go viral about. Mm. Because that's how you got to know about the soul one, right? You didn't yes. fly there to see it yourself, didn't you? Yeah, right? yeah. So it actually got viral and people started talking about it. So I think out-of-home advertising is just a very mass broadcast kind of medium where everybody have this similar wow, awe-inspiring feeling because you saw it off the internet, you didn't even see it in your face. Yes. And people are talking about it. So just this I think maybe this during this COVID period, but people are so open to innovation right now. Um, China just launched a flying drone advertising. So mm. you can create this public QR code mm. by just snapping into the sky, right? Even earlier this year, when Disney Plus launched in Singapore, they created this whole visual spectacle, yes. right? So there's that extreme part of outdoor advertising. If you're going to do it, do it big. Do it that people remember and it has that bandwidth space, right? That even people talk about it when the campaign is over. Mm. So I think having that spatial latitude and longitude ability, I think it's very, very interesting. It makes it very different and unique, right? Um, and then it allows the retailers, the brands, the malls to be very creative, the ads, uh, not just what they're trying to do, but to actually elevate the customer's shopping experience. So I think, um, how do you think um, shopping malls or retailers um, today should be looking at out-of-home marketing, outdoor advertising to improve their shopping experience? Definitely, when people go into a retail, it's also on entertainment. You know, people yep. can do buy anywhere actually, right? So when we are talking about going outdoors, especially now with this kind of COVID mentality, where we go outdoors, we also want to be very selective. So mm. are we going to a certain mall just to eat only? Are we going to a certain mall to eat, to shop, to have an enjoyment and the entire entertainment, right? It's a very, uh, I would say, holistic experience. And, you know, people also say, is it safe? Right. Mm. You know, people even talk about is it too busy place, you know, we want mm. to avoid the peak periods and things like that. So I think the mall experience and how outdoor advertising can play uh, is quite integrative. Mm. Right. I think there's also a lot of talk about the customer journey. Mm. Right. Yeah. When they go to the mall, where did they come from? Were they coming from a workplace? Were they coming from a, um their homes? Right. Or were they actually like um how often do they come back? The journey time, the dwell time, all these things are a little bit of data that always people keep talking about, right? But um, um, in terms of actually what they do inside the mall, right? Do they go to every floor in the mall, mm. right? Do they just only focus on where the food court levels are at B1 and level four, mm. right? So um, I think all these kind of things um, is all part of how we think as an advertiser as well, right? Where to place that particular location, mm. right? Yeah, I think... Well, very interesting point because just now we mentioned about the digital billboard, dynamic billboard or like fixed billboard, right? So now there's maybe there's some new concept will be like 
previously when we when some uh, brand they have a billboard right it's just a fixed billboard you may be using like traffic to count like how many how many people view potential can be viewed on a billboard right but now maybe people can think of like if i create a 3d billboard that might be very makes virus at online mm. so no i don't need to be like people really travel across that route and then they can see the advertising right but yeah. then they can just like see the advertising at online mm-hmm. i think that would be very very interesting right it once is. you mix that together with something like a qr code it becomes engagement already mm. and if that goes viral i don't need to be there to be a customer that engages with it i could be scanning the qr code at home yes, yes. Right. so this is very interesting very very interesting uh things that really unlock because of this yeah. yes yes Yep. So just just curious or like just have some some thought will be like it like within the small or just surrounding the mall, right? Is it you have any experience or you can share with us some of like dynamic like this kind of out of home mm. advertising? Uh like just now Imran mentioned about the QR code. Is it like someone do this or like uh what what is the result or like what is the like if they really roll this out, what will be the gap for them to actually execute this? Mm. So I just want to share a very interesting story about one of my uh, remittance clients. It's a bank which mm. is offering remittance service. And you right. know, everybody wants to offer remittance service now, yep. right? The banks are acting like telcos. The telcos are acting like banks, right? But there's also physical remittance services, right? That actually happens in the booth or the kiosk inside the mall. Yes. Mm. So one of the particular uh, malls that I represent is very famous for remittance. Mm. Uh, multiple competitors offering differing rates. You know, people just want to go for that 0.001 <laughs> that kind of differential. <laughs> and you can see yeah. the queues and queues <laughs> outside for it, you know, especially during the Chinese New Year period. Yeah. Mm. So the, uh, one of my bank clients was really smart about it. And just outside of the mall, they put up a QR code. Mm. And literally, they represented the QR code on a handphone, telling you that you can scan this and you get $10 back ah, if you use that service. So mm. I think that's a very interesting anecdote about how a bank without an actual physical outlet there can shortcut, you know, and get these people that are entering the malls to try to do remittance mm. back to try mm. out our service, right? Literally, you don't even need to have a salesperson to try to tell you. You know, now you can't even have that kind of like flyer distributor interaction. Mm. So I don't even need to help you like um, sell you the service with a one-to-one kind of selling. I just put a $10 offer there. I don't even need to use much words. It's a handphone visual, right? Mm. And it's a $10 free if you try my service. And why not? It's a really nice way of just intercepting the client mm. that's about to go in to do that particular operation to try out the online service. And it goes back to that 0.001 difference, right? Like it's, it's, it actually uh, shows a very smart understanding of the customer at that stage. Because if I'm going there and I'm going there for a 0.0001 and then suddenly I get the $10, it's almost a no-brainer at that exactly. point. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, people really go to some malls for specific interests, yep. specific users. Yep. And then after that, what happens after that? It's really up to the mall to capture that opportunity, right? Mm. So even now with the COVID situation, when I go to the mall, I want to be very executional, right? I need to get something. I don't want to get something done there. Is it food? Is it watching a movie? And what I do else after that, right? Mm. That's where the opportunity comes in for everybody that's inside that mall. Mm. So that's really quite fun. So let's say, for example, one of my friends recently was doing a lot of click and collect. Right. right. So hmm. nowadays, you know, insert- especially with COVID. Yes. yes. Yeah. Right. So I thought that why not you just send the shoe that you ordered to your house? Why would you want to go down to that physical location to collect it? Mm-hmm. Right. I thought you want to avoid the malls, right? You want to be safe from COVID. But she gave me a very, very uh, practical word. She said that I want to do the exchange on the spot if it didn't fit mm-hmm. me. Right. And she didn't want to go all the way to that outlet and realize that it's not in stock. Mm. Right, so it's very important to reserve the stock to be there, mm. and she doesn't want to go through the hassle of you know uh, arranging for a return, mm. and it's also an opportunity for her to buy even more things when she's there. So at least the one that she really wants, she wants to make sure that is there because you know shoe being shoes, right? Especially for ladies' shoes, mm. size thirty eight is quite flexible, <laughs> mm. right? So I really get where she's coming from, you know. So all this kind of intentionality, the buying intention, the last mile journey is where outdoor advertising is, I'm very passionate about. Mm. Because we always say, right, at the last mile is where you can make the difference. You know, you can be a fan of a certain brand, you 
uh, really into that brand for so many years and then somebody comes in with an offer and then suddenly you walk out with the competitor's brand. We always say, you know, that's where the last mall or the black box of marketing happens, mm. right? It's not like a home click, you know what you're getting, you click, it delivers. Those can be like, I would say standard items, lah. items mm. that you're very familiar with or items that um, you just buy on like a low risk kind of situation. Right. But when it comes to like buying ladies shoes or when it comes to like um, buying a certain uh, high class brand, the experience counts. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I, I think what, what you mentioned is very interesting. It's a lot of, about having customer insights, right? So back to your friend's anecdote around uh, the click and collect. Uh, and, and I think what advertisers, retailers, brands need to understand is what is the data saying in terms of telling the story of the customer. And then Therefore, what actions do we take? So with this whole idea and discussion so far that you had around OH, whether it's dynamic or not, um, I think where we intersect is, I think you're obviously a very passionate marketer. I actually am as well. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of uh, intersection between uh, what you're doing in terms of OH and marketing and consulting and uh, what I've experienced before. And a lot of the intersection, especially with the end brands or end retailers is, where does it meet with the data and ROI? So what I do want to ask here is, what is the ROI or the data that does matter uh, in this case, right? Because I think anecdotally from my own experience, when I have put money into OH, I didn't know where the money goes. Mm. So like, this, this is just pure anecdote, right? It's just my personal experience. But I know for a fact that the biggest brands in the world continue to put money into that. Yes. So there must be a reason why, right? So I, I'm, I'm very curious to understand from, from a practitioner POV what, what data matters. Mm. So I come from the supply side of providing the advertisement. Yeah. Right. So when it comes to actual feedback loop of what really happens, yep. you know, in terms of the um, how much the product is being sold, yep. I don't have that much visibility. I just want to be very, very honest with you yep. here. Mm -hmm. Right. But when it comes to uh, why clients are still choosing our locations or choosing outdoor, right? It's all back to um, people are still um, need to be reminded of, right? So how often do you buy an aircon? Mm -hmm. I think 99% of the time it's usually by the developer or, you know, some um, good brands give you a three-year, five-year warranty. Yep. But you want to make sure that when you are in time to buy an aircon, that's the brand that you would buy, yeah. right? And not, you know, walk into some uh, retailer and be like randomly influenced. Confronted with 10 choices. Yes, right? yeah. yes, yes. So that kind of brand space or reminder is very, very important. Like mm. why do you walk to a coffee shop and the refrigerators are red? Why are they not blue or green, right? There's a certain brand that is great that has sponsored all these refrigerators. So even mm. the color makes a difference. Yeah. And yeah. when I come from my advertiser point of view, let's say, for example, in Indonesia, the e-commerce platforms are so competitive. We did one campaign for them in the airport where we were in 30 airport lounges. These are the lounges just before the boarding. So it's yep. the last smile, right? Just yep. before they go up the airplane, there's no more duty-free shops. You've done your final scans and everything. And we created for them a resting space where it's green. The mm. chairs are green, the cushions are green, right? And because it's an e-commerce platform where we created this advertisement for them, it was not just the digital screen that we put there that put up all this e-commerce like bags, shoes, cooking pots and so on. Um, even the furniture that we bought, we had to prove that it was bought from their platform. So there was a QR code for them to scan which shop mm. it was gotten from and mm. so on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this kind of um, brand investment in terms of ROI, I really cannot answer in detail. It wouldn't be fair because I am quite a particular person in terms of data, mm. but I can see that brands really um, reinforces that, mm. right? Mm. Even that tiny memory space in terms of a color, mm. you know, they mm. want to make sure that, you know, I stand for green in this particular e-commerce space, mm. right? So mm. the kind of investment even into the color is very important, especially in highly competitive, right? When I say red in telco, you know which one I'm talking about. Right, a blue mm. in telco in Singapore. You also know which one I'm talking about, right? So this is just a memory space. We are all made of memories. Mm. One thing that also sticks out for me in that sharing is the fact that uh, it's also very clear that the large e-commerce and internet giants are also utilizing this as a very important channel mm. for growth as well as that brand memorability as well yes. as they seek to entrench the in uh, the 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 precedents right or or, or the uh, dinosaurs in the space, so to speak. Um, 
June, any question next? Yeah, I, I think bring out a very interesting point, right? So the offline space, when we talk about like the billboard and everything, but I think we bring out to one very interesting point is actually the offline experience. Mm. Billboard is just a billboard, right? Yes. Actually, like I mentioned about the entire app part, it's actually color things. It's, it's more on experience. So mm. brand awareness, when I look at the green, I will have related to some like e-commerce mm. player. So it's more like the experience. So what kind of like data point, I'm just curious, right? What kind of data point that you think that like um, if shopping mall or if an agency or if a marketer know, mm -hmm. and then this can help, right? So just now you... Uh, you give a very good example. If a mall or if a, a advertising company know that in this mall, a lot of people will come to do the money exchange. Mm -hmm. So my billboard is I will find a bank and I can charge more because it's very targeted, right? Yes. So like what kind of data point that you think is important or what uh, the advertising can looking, advertiser can looking at? Yeah, so it really goes back to, let's say if these people are here for remittance, they are usually a certain profile. I mean, let's not talk about age. Let's not talk about gender. Let's not talk about the jobs they do. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of briefs that come like that. They give me like this, oh, we want to target this age group, this this gender, and like this. I To me, it's so arbitrary, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. people who come for remittance services, right, especially those that do it regularly and do it at certain bonus months or certain payday months, you know that they will like other services as well. Right, mm. certain telco service will be a very good complement. Mm. Certain airline service will be a very good complement. Right, so it's almost very natural, right, to have this kind of like targeting for them as well. What else do they do during their spare time? You know, why do they take their only rest day of the week to come all the way here, mm. all the way here to do this? So it's a very nice targeting in that way, right, to give them the whole suite of services they are looking for as well. Right, the same thing where you go to like maybe um, some more generic malls, right? There are some neighborhood malls, right? That I wouldn't be surprised if they have a higher transactional volume, mm. right? There's some of the Orchard malls, mm. right? So why am I paying more for an Orchard mall? It's a perceived value, right? That Orchard may be more expensive, mm. right? It's more prestigious, but does it really matter, right? When I'm interested as maybe a FMCG brand, or if I'm mm. interested, you know, as an aircon brand. Right. Would I need to pay for that kind of money in that kind of locations? I, I have to ask myself that. Mm -hmm. right? So this is where um, I can see some kind of a mass, I would call it the mass luxury brands. Right? They also have moved to some so-called neighborhood malls recently, like how Westgate and so on have brought in some uh, mass affluent uh, brands as well when they first set up. Right, so you can see that the buying power is not just you know in Orchard per se, mm -hmm. right? So I think for me, this kind of information about what happens inside the mall is very very interesting, right? It can create a whole new story, you know, just for a certain uh, category like we talk about the remittance mm -hmm. and what airlines can do to target that, what insurance can do to target that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's a lot more granular, yeah. And for me, it's always much more interesting than each group. <laughs> <laughs> then mm -hmm. uh, what is the gender and what is the so-called perceived income, yeah. right? How would we know, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how would I know what a millionaire dress like, seriously? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or where did I hang out? I won't be surprised. <laughs> so you probably think you touched a lot of uh, very interesting points here, right? Um, I think the question I, I would like to ask, especially with AI Amazing as data practitioners, is um, if we were able to marry the practice of granular transaction data, right? So real sales data. Um, what can we, where can we move the advertising space, especially the OOH space too? Um, from your point of view, is there any uh, ideal scenario, ideal world that you'd like to m move this practice towards for yourself and your business and for the advertisers uh, and the customers that you serve? Yeah, I think it's pretty much like my sharing with June just now about the remittance company, yes. right? It will actually create a lot more complementary customers or clients that can also target the same audience there. Yep. Because your transactional data also gives them uh, more perspective rather than are they by demographics mm -hmm. or whether they're by income. You can start to think about the habits and what else they would need or they will come here for. Mm -hmm. Right. So for example, we did have a client that uh, marketed uh, budget airlines in the past. So literally the message was, would you rather fly home for your home cooked food or for your you know um, mm. home home style food rather than to eat it at this place? Mm. Right? Because you know a cost of a meal in Singapore is not cheap. 
right? So if you want good Sichuan food or you want a good uh, Myanmar food, why don't you just fly home over the weekend for a real one? Mm. Because that's what he's trying to compare, right? Right, right? right. So it's a very on the spot, on that kind of... Um, exactly what's happening there. People go there to have that particular meal and say, why don't you just fly home for it? Mm. You know, so I think this kind of conversation can happen, right? Instead of just like purely from an ethnicity or demographic point of view, mm. right? If you know that the people went there to eat something, yeah, just fly home for one. I think it's a very nice um, actuality that's happening on the ground. Mm. So I, th- I think with that, uh, you know, we've come to the closing segment of the podcast, uh, the easy questions. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so which is... Uh, uh, what's your advice, right, to first audience, mall managers, second audience, your retail brands. Um, they're all thinking about where are we evolving to, what should I be spending my time on, where should I be centering my campaigns on, uh, where, where, how do we move forward with reopening, with revival, with uh, uncertainty. Yeah, you know, I think this, this is, uh, these are the realities that they're facing yes. today, right? So th- those are the questions on the mind. What would be your top advice to each of them? Yeah, I think first and foremost, we really have to acknowledge marketers nowadays. Their jobs are really tough, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right? I'm not sure even having more data will be helping them because right now it's not so clear cut anymore where they should be parking their attention and their money, you know, or even like um, the so-called digital advertising versus the actual physical offline advertising. Or even now we just had a little talk about the metaverse, right? Yeah. Should they be parking <laughs> their money there now to be the first people there? So I really want to give my hats off to all the um, advertisers out there, you know, who have the mixed sense of this, right? So I think for advertisers, really go on the ground to understand. Right, numbers are numbers. They will support you, they will help you, but it doesn't beat getting out there and really seeing where your audience eat, live, and work. Mm-hmm. Right. So for me, even if I go to um, Thailand, even if I go to like Jakarta or any part of the world where I put a billboard, I always want to spend some time there. You know, and really depend on the gut feel. Is this the target audience that I can really um, get in touch with? Right. So from my advertise, uh, from my marketer's point of view, I really admire uh, my clients. They really know what they're going for and they really trust the gut feeling. Right. And uh, really try to uh, retain that group of um, eyeballs and mind space that they have with their customers. Right. And in terms of um, my landlords, right, I got all kinds of landlords, including the corporate malls, including like private landlords. I want to just um, have them to be more open about the kind of working arrangements that is possible or even the pricing arrangement. And at the end of the day, it's an ecosystem. Yes. Right? So uh, whatever happens, uh, whatever clients that we bring in, it's supposed to help their business as well and also other tenants as well and vice mm. versa. Yeah. Right? So um, the, the key thing is to keep, um, keep the business, you know? I think humans thrive on that kind of social and the business, right? So... Um, have, have more flexibility, be more open, right? And just have fun. Advertising is not serious, mm. right? Yeah. Mm. It's supposed to be a form of entertainment anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think those are very earnest and very practical words. Mm. And the last question, like, um, do you think the physical retail will still be the king? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, I think nothing beats that image, right? Of Julia Roberts in Pretty Woman coming down, you know, um, after the shopping experience with bags and bags of like uh, retail experience where she's treated like a princess or the Cinderella. So I think for this kind of thing, you know, it doesn't run away from the physical, mm. right? And then um, retail just comes in as a whole um, experience of being in a mall, of being out there. You know, we're all hunter-gatherers, huh? Mm-hmm. We want to go back with something, you know, for the family or for ourselves, you know. So, uh, uh, it's very just... Very true, very yeah, true. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun, right? Yes, yes. So, it has to be, right? Um, uh, keep keep innovating on that, right? Yeah. Humans just need that, that mm-hmm. kind of interaction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. I think, I think very interesting that I uh, just want to add on. Like, I think last Friday, I was uh, in Nets, mm. the shopping malls, right? I can't even get into the shopping mall because the... Black Friday and yes. then it's the first week that the government opened up to like five mm. person in the fun table. 
can't even get into the mall. You need to queue outside at the mall. I think you need to spend about, I think it's about half an hour, one yes. hour to just enter the mall. That's right. right? I think that's like, people is really, really like, yes. need. A lot of talks about revenge dining, revenge shopping, you know, getting out there again. And people are now more open yeah. to getting out to different places. So even just now you talk about the standard retail that you have to go to a certain mall to do something. People a lot of these brands are now moving to like maybe even shop houses yep. or moving to like more flexible um, um, pop-up stores, pop -up stuff, stores yeah. right? Even just next to the mall, right? So it's also the environment outside the mall. Mm -hmm. You know, things that you thought that it was just a park, they also have an experiential shopping experience, you know, or even the landscape nursery, you know, it's also becoming a dog place. It's also becoming, you know, a food place, a shopping place. So it's just really open nowadays yeah. where people can go and where people can buy. Yeah, it's just, just things are changing. It's, yeah, it's it seems changing. to be, it seems to be that there's two constants here, right? The, the retail environment will continue to innovate, mm -hmm. yet somehow that human instincts will always kind of remain the same. Uh, it's just that how do we evolve given the context? Yeah, it's always the same. The food that we eat, the data that we consume, the way we go to a mall, the way we come together, it's just the fundamentals are there. Yeah. So I think with that, we've come to the end of today's episode. Thanks again, April, for being here today, sharing with us a very interesting perspective on the retail industry. To all listeners, thank you for listening in, engaging. If you have any questions for April, of course, drop it in to our socials and I'm sure uh, April will be very happy to answer you. Uh, send your questions our way and stay tuned for our next episode. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. How will retail change post-pandemic? Download the Future of Retail white paper from our website, aimazing.com.